What's good, everybody? Welcome back to Renegade Radio. I am super psyched for you to hear today's episode with Steve Sims. He is the founder of Bluefish. It's the world's first luxury concierge service that delivers the highest level of personalized travel, transportation, and cutting-edge entertainment services to corporate executives, celebrities, pro athletes, and anyone looking to live life to the fullest. This is going to be a unique episode, and Steve's going to Steve has a really unique way of thinking about things and answering questions and approaching problems and coming up with solutions and getting a yes. He doesn't ever get a no. I mean, I'm sure probably once in a while he does, but I, you know, it was just, I, I think you're really going to be fascinated by the way Steve approaches things. And so you're going to have huge takeaways from this episode. I mean, Steve started out kind of just a broke kid in Ireland, and his story's fascinating, and now he runs Bluefish. He's got the, uh, the the book out, Bluefishing. Some of the experiences that Steve and Bluefish have made possible for people include visiting the International Space Station, taking a submarine, trip to the Titanic, becoming James Bond for a weekend in Monte Carlo, uh, enjoying a role on a hit TV show, hanging out and jamming with Guns N' Roses and ZZ Top, having Georgia Florida Line sing Happy Birthday to you. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. He's also started Blue Cause, which has raised over a half million dollars from nonprofit profit organizations without taking one cent in administrative fees. He's been featured in Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, London Times. And Steve is not interested in being all things to all people. And you will hear that come across loud and clear today when uh, when you hear Steve on the podcast. Just awesome stuff. And we hung out afterwards. I'm going to talk to Steve for another three hours and just ask his opinion on almost everything because I, I love his insight and his thought process. This show is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's so much more than just another green supplement. It's literally the number one supplement out there, the all-in-one insurance policy covering your multivitamin, your multimineral, your uh, support for blood sugar levels in the normal range. It's got an antioxidant blend, a green superfood blend, adapted in hormone support, neural support, detox and liver, probiotics, digestive enzymes, all that and more in one instantly mixing delicious packet of athletic greens. Take it with you when you travel so you don't get sick on the planes. Uh, there's no harmful added ingredients, nothing fake, nothing artificial, no herbicides or pesticides, none of the normal allergens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash J-A-Y right now to claim your special offer from Athletic Greens as a listener of this podcast. Get it today at athleticgreens.com slash J-A-Y. And if you want to further your health, further your fitness, further your gains, head on over to renegadestrengthclub.com. That's renegadestrengthclub.com where you get my latest and greatest training programs. We have a new one that just started recently that's up now. Um, great stuff over there and that, that's where you'll get, get get the workouts the videos Q&A with me renegadestrengthclub.com and now here is my man Steve Sims All right, Steve, thank you so much for doing the show. I appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you today. Uh, For those who don't know, let's talk about your company and what you do and how you got started. Wow. Okay. So there's a few different... uh, Yeah. So what were you doing before you started Bluefish and how you kind of... Let's work through the progression. All right. So uh, East London construction boy. I was a bricklayer. Uh, My father owned the construction firm, which consisted of him and my mum. So, you know, there's only two of them. So uh, I left school at 15, went straight into the construction field. Um, And then just didn't want to be there. Um, There was just this inkling in me that I didn't want to do it. All of my other relatives were in the construction industry. We're an Irish family. Um, And I remember vividly one day going up into a building site, climbing up the ladder, and I could see down this scaffolding line, my dad, my granddad, my uncle, my cousins, my entire family tree was in front of me. I could see my future wow. and it stopped me. It, yeah. In fact, it stopped me because my dad yelled at me and he's like, what are you stood there for? You know, it just it was that impactful that I went down to lunchtime and I went, you know, I was talking to my granddad. I said, do you ever think you, he said, quit now. He Jeez. said, because you won't quit tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow never comes. He said, and what'll happen? He said, 30 years time, you'll be on that line. Yeah. And uh, I quit. Quit that day. I quit that day. 
And wow. um, I didn't know what I was going to do. So my dad, you know, wasn't happy with me. My mum wasn't happy with me. Started driving cake vans and all these different kind of things. Doing what you know, vans? Cake vans. Oh, okay. yeah, delivering cakes oh, okay. to supermarkets in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Basically anything that would earn me any money because I knew I, I couldn't do this. And then a friend of mine worked for a banking organization. And he told me that uh, they were interviewing interns because a bunch of these stockbrokers, this was in the 80s, yeah. you know, when there were so many stockbrokers everywhere. Right. And uh, they were interviewing a bunch of interns because they were doing a massive migration of UK stockbrokers over to Hong Kong. Mm. So I borrowed my dad's suit and I went in for uh, to apply for this because being a bricklayer, no education, I had nothing to lose. You know, I could walk out of that environment and if they went, no, you haven't got the job, I wasn't humiliated because it was sure. a long shot to start with, yeah. you know? But I went in there and I went in the, the wrong room. And I went in the room where they were talking to all of the brokers that were actually going to Hong Kong. And they had a massive great breakfast buffet. And I remember coming out of that, uh, that room to go into the intern one, there was no breakfast buffet. Mm. So I thought the chances of me getting the job are low, but the chances of me getting fed are much better of me being in the other room. So I went <laughs> in the other room, single-handedly challenged myself, see how much of this buffet I could eat. <laughs> and just was eating everything. It was yeah. the first place I ever had salmon for breakfast, wow. you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I do remember that, you know? And so this guy's standing up on stage talking to the brokers about, well, you know, Hong Kong is this, and it's got so many years left under British rule, and now uh, we're going to be doing it. I just ate the breakfast. And then uh, I remember him saying, as you leave the room, make sure the girls have your details and we'll send you the, uh, the travel package. So I got up, walked out, walked, saw this girl. I just thought, eh, I'm going to go for another shot, you know? So I said to this girl, I went, oh, Steve Sims. And she looks at this list and she went, oh, we don't have you down here. Surprise, you know? <laughs> so I went, oh, no, you're kidding. Not again. No. Nope. Let me take your name and address. She took my name and address down. I went through. The interns had already left, so I went home. And then it was about two weeks later, I got a welcome pack and my flight ticket to go to Hong Kong. Really? Yeah. So I landed. I landed on the. Uh, I left on the Friday. Landed on the Saturday. Had to tell my girlfriend. She wasn't my wife at the time. Had to tell her I got this job. What do I do? She went. You took a shot. You got it. You know. The bigger answer is, what if you don't take a shot at this? Yeah. What if you don't try? You're, well, what's going to happen to you? If you try and fail, eh. but if you don't try. And so, you know, my wife is, um, you know, five foot four, scary. And, uh, you know, for anyone that's hearing this on the podcast, I'm a little bit more than that. Um, but she still terrifies the pants out of me. And she was, she was the one that often gives me a bit of a kick and tells me to go. So I went for it. Landed on the Saturday, parted with the boys on the Saturday, parted with the boys on the Sunday, went into orientation on the Monday, and I was fired on the Tuesday. So <laughs> they realized that, you know, I had uh, blagged my way into it. And so now I'm in Hong Kong. They let me stay in the apartment for three months because apparently that was part of the contract. Okay. So the other boys stayed in the, in the, in the apartment hated me because I now had a free apartment. Yeah. And get this, I had to get a severance package because they had brought me to Hong Kong and fired me. Ah, so I got wow. like three months salary. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't a great deal. And I was then living in like the world's most expensive city. Right. So like a coffee, coffee was like 20 bucks. You know, it was just stupid. Oh, you know? oh yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, so the money was flying down real fast. Yeah. And um, I just remember hanging out in bars and starting to get into that dark period of kind of like, where's my life going? Mm. Quite simply, I'm in one of those bars one night. And how old were you at the time? Uh, t uh, about twenty. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, just over twenty. Um, and um, you know, I was a big lad. I used to do kickboxing when mm -hmm. I was in London. So you know, I was uh, young, lean, and thought I was invincible. Mm -hmm. Typical, sure. typical sure. East London boy. And um, I'm just. I've always had a shaved head. You know, so I'm just sat in the corner drinking, thinking, "Where's my life going?" You know, oh my god, I've made a mistake. And the owner, the uh, the owner of the club of the bar, this this lady comes over to me and she said, uh, "You know, I need you to help me. You know, do you work door?" And I said, "I've worked door before." And um, she said, "Well, look, you know, we've got some uh, gualos, some phalangs, some foreigners over on this table." And she said, "Our people are going to come and take them out in a minute." Can you go and talk some sense in them and get them to leave? So that was my first introduction to Hong Kong door work. And I went over and told them they needed to leave and they did. So she hired me on the spot. And then I started working the door for, for um, Hong Kong nightclubs in Wan Chai. Wow. And that's how it started. How long did that last? That only lasted for about four months. Okay. Um, 
what tended to happen was I started working on these clubs. These, this, these families owned a lot of the different clubs in the Wan Chai area, uh, now coming into the 90s. And um, they would move me around different clubs. And so I got to see, you know, the upscale clubs, you know, the shitty ones, all this kind of stuff. And I started going, look, you know, let me have Tuesday night and I'll invite a bunch of the regulars, you know, and see if we can, if I can get some extra money out of it. So I ended up becoming like a, a, a party promoter. And then I was like, well, let's do it a little bit more. And so I started doing this kind of thing and I started having passwords. And that's how the bluefish turned out. And so, so how did you get good at this? Like, how did you know how to do that? Were you just always like keeping mental notes of what works and what yeah, doesn't? And- it was weird because you got to always remember that I was and am an uneducated East London bricklayer. Okay, it's as simple as that. I don't think I'll ever change. You know, I started life in black t-shirt and jeans on a motorbike, and I came here today, black, black t-shirt, t-shirt and jeans, jeans on a motorbike. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think a lot of me has actually changed. And I try to keep things primitive. And I love that. I was delusional in so many times in my life, but I'm now stuck in, in Hong Kong. And I thought to myself, okay, I want a job. How do I get a job? Well, that's easy. Meet someone that's rich and powerful and owns a company. For me, that was simple. You know, if you want to go and you know, go fishing, go where fish feed. You yeah. know? For me, it was a simple thing. So I didn't let poor people into the club because poor people can't employ me. Yeah. Rich people can. Yeah. So, yeah, people would come to a door and I'd be like, guys, it's very busy in there tonight, but you can buy a table, five grand, you know, and you can have all your drink. And they were like, eh, okay. So all of a sudden, when I realized that you were now cultivating within the club a lot of affluent people and yeah. raising the caliber. So then I started uh, taking over yachts and penthouses, always thinking that if I could get this Rolodex of powerful people, yeah. and this is funny because it only came to me about six months ago at the age of 51, only came to me sick. It's the only time in my night, my life, I never asked for anything. Huh. You know, my whole job is about asking, how can I get that? How can I position this? How can I, that period in my life, I was building up this network and I was starting to do all of these wonderful things for them. Yeah. But never once did I actually ask them for a job. Mm. It's the only time it was kind of weird, but maybe it was meant to be. I'm pleased I never got a job because otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So now. I, I, I'm, I'm a details person. I'm fascinated by this. So how, how do you move on to you're saying yachts and, and a big part of like, yeah, just how does this, all this progress? So I, I always had, uh, and I've always had a, a prick policy. I don't want to have pricks in my life at all. You I know, love that. It's yeah. simple as that, yeah. you know, zero flakes. Yeah. And so what I would do was we would have a special night you know, and there'd be a special theme in the club or the bar. And I would send out, and this is, this is a age me, I would send out a fax of what bar I was working at that night. Okay. And I would tell them, you've got to, you know, seven o'clock or eight o'clock or 12 o'clock, whatever, this location, this is the password. And that password was my filter. Mm. So I would have on there things like name two of the Teletubbies. <laughs> And finish this sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. Yeah. And the toughest one that got a lot of people, bear in mind, this is the the early 90s now. No one had, you know, Google or anything like this. Yeah. Name the lion out of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It's Aslan. Ah. Now, here's the funny thing. Those were the three ones, uh-huh. and I would just rotate them, uh-huh. okay? Okay. Um, but the funny thing is, you'd have these guys turning up at the door, and I'm the meathead on the door. So my fellow meathead's next to me. The whole party's kicking off behind. There's a line of people just about to come in, all smiley dressed. You can tell everyone's kind of, I've got a bit of cash because they've been invited because they got cash. Uh, and in the expatriate world, there were all these expatriate newspapers welcoming different people. So you always had a way of contacting them. Okay. You know, And em- embassies always did these parties once a month, welcoming the new expatriates. So th- it was obvious where to find these people and invite them. Yeah. And uh, you would get these guys walk up to the door and they would go, oh, I'm here for the party. And it's all kicking off and you'll be like, um, anything you want to tell me? They'd be like, no, I'm here for the party. No, I don't think there's a party here. And you, you look over to your mate and you go, hey, Colin, there's no party. No, there's no party here tonight. <laughs> maybe it's down at, maybe a wrong date. I don't know. Yeah. And we just basically blanked the guy. And you could see him getting wound up with his girlfriend or something. And they'd go off. And then if we had As- Aslan was the best one. Because no one ever got it right. Right. You know? But you get these guys come up to you. And I remember the head of Reebok, okay, for Asia, coming up to me. And he was, he was looking at me. He was like... I don't know. Is it Robert? We were like, <laughs> no. He was like, oh, bloody, is it Tigger? We were like, just go in. But yeah. it was a way of just filtering. If you weren't 
humble and just there to have fun, just to get through the door, it wasn't going to improve once you're in. That was when I really learned from an early age, our souls don't get better with time. Yeah. So, you know, nip it in the bud, get it out of your life. It's a cancer, get it out. Zero tolerance for it. Um, and I think my gut reaction of that door work and coming from, let's be honest, the shitty side of London, you almost had that kind of street vibe. Yeah. And it was the only education I had that there was a gut reaction that this guy's got a smart suit on, but there's something wrong about this boy. Mm. So I'm not letting him in. And I was always a great believer in cancer. It, it, it grows sure. slowly and small. Um, so I, I, I stamp it out. And I've got it wrong. I've turned some really good people away. But that's how I started with that gut reaction. And didn't you continue to work the door maybe long after you could have stopped working the door parties? Yeah, I did. And funny enough, when, um, when Bluefish, and it, this, that was the funny thing, people suddenly started to think of this organization which wasn't it was only me and my wife but they started to think of this this party planning and this event production company and no one knew what the name of it was because we'd never given it a name yeah so because we'd used bluefish you know they couldn't exactly well maybe maybe they would have called us tinky winky po or, or aslan but luckily they went for bluefish and they were like oh there's that bluefish company we'd be like yeah all right you know so <laughs> we just adopted what people were asking for and when we actually did when we decided to turn it into a company, because now we were throwing big events and we were taking over yachts and we were, we were getting jewelry companies involved. We were getting champagne, yacht brokers. Now get them to pay for the party and charging the client. You know, we were minted. So yeah. it, was, it was really, it was starting to work. I was still working the door because I still felt that, you know, frontline is the best place to be to filter. You know, you can't filter from an ivory tower. Yeah. And even now, today, you know, I filter 90% of the clients that come into Bluefish. I try to make the phone call because if I can stop the problems at the front door, they don't go any further. Right. Um, and if I'm going to get 20 really cool people together at an Oscar table, I don't want one of them to be a prick yeah. and annoy everyone's night. Yeah. So, I'm a, so I could have left the door way before I did, but I always found that that was the best place to be. And which saddens me a lot because you can actually take that analogy and you see so many business people who are damn good at doing what they do. And as soon as they start making money, they end up putting themselves in the ivory tower, mm. taking themselves away from A, what they're really good at, and B, what they're passionate about. Yeah. And now what they end up doing every day is looking at paperwork, talking to that segment, going over accounts. Yeah. Get someone else to do that. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to expand on that a little bit more, but let's just go a little bit more through the journey because what you do now is so amazing, so cool, so <laughs> impressive. So just take us through a little bit more of the steps to, you know, how it grows to where it's at right now. Well, being in the expatriate community, you know, you, you got to meet a lot of uh, heads of companies, uh, ambassadors, um, you know, rich, powerful people, not famous. That's, that's the key misunderstanding. The famous people usually aren't the richest. It's the one that backs yeah. them and things like that. Yeah. So the Hollywood mogul walking around the world, you know, he's the guy that's got billions. Um, so, but people would come to me and they'd be like, oh, you know, that was a great party. There's a party in Macau. Do you know anything about it? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm sure I can handle it. So it started growing. And before you knew it, if I didn't know in Macau, I knew someone in Hong, in Hong Kong that knew Macau, that knew someone in Monaco. So now I had mm. Monaco. Now I had Stad because the rich people, quite simply, they flock around the world. Yeah. Okay. The people that go to the Monaco Grand Prix are the same people that go to the Kentucky Derby. They're the same people that go to Wimbledon. Right. They're the same people that go to Stad Polo and the Hong Kong Yacht Fair. It's the same group. So you, if you can get into that kind of flow, then you can start picking up on all those iconic events. So I would be the guy that would just go forward and say, look, I've got some really cool people that want to go to this event. What needs to happen? Or, you know, just bluntly go up to people and say, hey, I need two tables. Um, I want, you know, one up by the stage, one here. What have I got to do to make this happen? And so I would just be very front and say I needed this. And it would just start happening. The more I did that same click would go to the party and talk about what they'd just done. And then I'd get a tap on the shoulder at a party going, I hear you sent Jimmy to, to Monaco with like, you know, Formula One Ferrari. Yeah. yeah I'm going, you know, to an awards show in, in Hollywood or I want to, can you do that? And it just grew that, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do 
That's how it's Steve, doing. talk about at the beginning, though, the first time you're making those calls saying, how do I get this person into this? Because now you're, you're, you're big and powerful and influential and know all these people. So it, it seems easy yeah. for someone listening. But how do you yeah. do it at first? How do you call and get someone in when people don't know who Steve and Blue yeah. Fish is? I remember, I remember the first one. And it was, it's, it's funny. Do you know, funny, not a lot of people ask me that question, though. You know, they all want to know about what I do with Elton John and Bocelli and all yeah. that. But no one ever asked me about the first one. I was working on the door of a club in Wan Chai. Okay. And these four guys came up that were pretty regular. And they told me about this party that was going on later on that night down at Victoria Harbor um, and in Hong Kong. So they said, oh, I really want to get on. I said, well, have you done anything about it? And they went, no, 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 you can't get. And I noticed straight away the, and there's a guy called Greg Reed that talks about it. The, you know, your, the size of your butt gets in front of you, but I can't do this, but yeah, I can't. Yeah. And this guy was biting himself to death. And he was like, oh, but it's this, and I can't do that. Right. And I just thought to myself, he's putting that event on a pedestal and then pushing that away. There's no way he can achieve it because every three seconds he's moving that goalpost further and further away. Mm. And I just thought to myself, it can't be that hard. And again, that's where the uneducated, unintimidated, you know, East London yeah. bricklayer went. I was I was the, the kids' clothes, you know, as we call it, the king's clothes. I think you call it the emperor's, yeah. you know, that that myth, you know, yep. the emperor's naked. Right. I'm stood there going, why oh, doesn't he just ask? Yeah. You know, these are four heads of companies compared to a lot of people, more money than God. Why shouldn't they be at the party? Right. You know? Um, so I went... I'll, I'll see what I can do. So I literally took time off of the door and I went down there and, uh, you know, I walked down to the boat and I saw him getting everything ready because it wasn't going to start for about another three or four hours. And I saw a girl with a clipboard and I walked, to, walked up to her and I said, hey, how you doing? I'm Steve Sims. Uh, I've got four coming in tonight. Do you want them here at quarter to eight or do you want them at half eight? What's going to be best for your door flow? And uh, they were like, oh, uh, what's the names? And I gave them the names. And she's looking through the list. And as she's looking through the list, I went, sorry, I've got to get back. But do you want them at quarter to eight or do you want them at half past eight? And she was like, oh. I said, I want to be considerate for you. I don't want them all turn up when, you know, you've got to be doing She went, uh, quarter to eight would be good. Let me just make sure I got that. And I said, thank you very much. And I said, oh, by the way, I appreciate it. Thank you. Gave 100 bucks. Yeah. You know, and I said, I appreciate you. you, know, you you're going to have a tough one tonight. Good luck with everyone. So I wanted to show her that I empathize with what shitstorm she was going to be going into that night. Yeah. And um, so I said, oh, what is your name? And so I took her name and you know gave her my name. And so I went back to the guys, went back and to the And then she bar. put the names on the list or no? She wrote the names okay. down on the list. Yeah, yeah. She told them to be there at quarter to eight. Yeah. So I went back to the boys. I went, right, two grand, 500 bucks a pop. And they were like, great. And I realized then that people are intimidated to do anything. They're scared of fear itself. Yeah. They butt the thing so far away that they're never going to be able to get to. And people don't just do the simplest thing, which is to step forward. Right. Whatever it is, take one step forward so that you are closer to your goal than you were 10 minutes ago. Yeah. And just that one step. And if you can do two steps, three steps, you end up with momentum. Nothing can stop momentum. And it's never as bad as we fear, right? Like yeah, we imagine it worse it in your head. Like what's well, so scary about asking someone something? What's the worst thing they can do? Yeah. They go, no. Yeah. Well, funny enough, I'm still stood. Right. You know, I haven't lost my limbs. Right. You know, my family's still good. She's just offended me by saying the word no. And do you know how I got over that? Never ask a question that they can say no to. I didn't ask her if four people could go in. Yeah. I didn't ask her, you know, is it okay? I asked her to confirm a question. Mm. And I do that now. I, I had, um, I did a party, and obviously this is much grander scale. I did a private dinner party in uh, the Academia in Florida, mm. uh, not Florida, Florence. And uh, the Academia is a museum that houses Michelangelo's David. And I contacted them because I wanted to do a private dinner party at the feet of Michelangelo's David. And then halfway through dinner, I had, had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade him. When I contacted the Academia, I said to him, I want to do this. And this could be fantastic for you. I would also like to be able to make a great donation to your foundation. Okay, what do we need to do to make this happen? Mm. I didn't ask them, can I have a dinner here? That had gone, no. Yeah. Have you ever done it here before? No. Why can't I have it? You know, these are, these are questions you're not prepared for the answer. Yeah. So never ask a question you can, you can get answered with a no, unless no is the answer you want. Now, quite often, mm. I've got people into it, and then I've said to them, did you ever think this could actually happen? Or has this ever happened before? 
And that's when you want the no. Right. You want them to go, no. And you go, isn't that fantastic? We're not doing something. We're making history. We're part of changing something. You, me and you, we did this. Yeah. We're the Wizard of Oz, you know? And that's when you get them just absolutely committed to whatever the dream is. So that's kind of like a foundational principle all the time. Yeah, I really have never complicated it. I've always been a great believer in be, uh, there's a difference between being easy to understand and impossible to misunderstand. And it's that dormant, rough edge, blunt, zero onion layers, this is what I want and this is what it's in it for you. And there's a word that's going around this year, which makes me puke. Do you remember last year's keyword? It was 10x. Okay, yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> Everything was 10x. Yeah. The amount of emails you could buy Viagra with 10x. <laughs> you could buy this course on 10x your income. Yeah. Everything was 10x. Yeah. It was puking. Yeah. So what's the word of this year? Authenticity. Oh, ah, bingo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sickening. Yeah. It's, it should be like, going, oh, look at him. He breathes. Right. You know? Right. I've never liked authenticity. Okay, no, sadly, people have described that of me and I rebut it every single time. I'm transparent. Mm. You know, and there's a great, great deal of difference in that. You meet me, you know who I am. Yeah. Okay. Within minutes of us meeting each other, you knew what, who I was, what I stood for. I'm a very easy person to read. Right. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't go away going, did he mean this? <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's no yeah. layers there. Yeah. And so I was a great believer from a very, very early stage that I can communicate as long as there's transparency. And that transparency is for me to let you know what I want and what's in it for you very quickly. Mm. And if you're in a conversation where you don't know the person, lead with what's in it for them because you already know what's in it for you yeah. and you're talking to them. So they know you want something. So go in with, hey, I want to do this for you because I'm looking at getting this. Yeah, And be very crystal clear within the first few seconds, get that out. With the internet the way it is now, and you almost being able to cyber stalk people. Yeah. It's very easy or it's easier to get your foot in the door, but that's not the trick anymore. Mm. The trick is to be so irresistible. They don't want you to leave. Right. That's the key. That's the source. It's kind of sad that, that I knew what you were talking about, the word authenticity. And it's a shame because you see a lot of the people who talk about authenticity all the time <laughs> are the fakest people. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. They stand up there and they clap like seals for five minutes until <laughs> they want to get on their feet. No, it's um, it's frightening. Yeah. Um, it really is scary. But it's, it's a real, I think it's a cry for help um, because as we've got every social platform out there trying to show you that my shit don't stink in my life is absolutely way more perfect than yours. Yeah. Um, that coming out there with this, 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 um, these wounds, the ones that really upset me, and I've seen this a few times and it does upset me when they get on there and they try to tell you a story and they fake choke. Mm. I'm sorry, excuse me, this is, this is, this is deep. It's, it's about my dog. Yeah. You know, it's just... Shut up. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's upsetting. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what's more annoying, them or the idiots that are buying into this. Yeah. Um, but it's it's very frightening. And I do actually think it's a cry for help. People want to be able to relate to something. And we are pack animals. Yeah. So we, we all want to follow something. We totally. want we want to find mentors. We want to find partners. We want to find tribe and community. And the trouble is, all the social platforms we got out there now are giving us artificial angels. Yeah. My God, that's a good word. That should be a T-shirt. Artificial great. angels. Yeah. Damn good. We're Heard it here first. Trade, yeah, exactly. So, talk about then building real relationships because it seems like your business obviously has to be built on real, authentic relationships. And so, how do you go about? And you know, you talk about social media where we're connected more than ever, but really disconnected. You know, especially yeah. younger kids coming up, they barely even have the social skills they'll, they'll need. So just talk about like how you go about building and maintaining relationships, standing out in this 2017 digital communication world, things like that. All right. Well, um, standing out is very easy. Be you. Yeah. Because, you know, you put 10 people in the room and they're all different. So first of all, don't try to be anybody else because one, being someone else takes effort. Yeah. Being you takes none. Yeah. Okay. So that was my first decision years ago. And I learned that the, the, the bad way. When I started traveling around the world and meeting loads of rich and famous people, I started wearing suits. I literally started taking out my earrings. Um, I bought a car. Wow. <laughs> which was something. <laughs> I bought a bloody car. And um, I would turn up in this car and I would get out. I'd put my suit jacket on. 
and I was like this rigid shell of a person trying to give you some kind of pers perspective of me or perception, and it was wearing me out. Right. Um, and so I lost a lot of clients and gained the wrong ones. So luckily I went back to look. We all brand and we all want to be different and special and stand out in a crowd by being you, you already do. Can I ask you something there? Uh, what are your thoughts on only putting yourself in social social situations where you can be your best self? Like if you get invited to something and you know it's gonna be around people you don't wanna be in, but it's a great opportunity, do you say no to that? Because I've kind of leaned towards that more. Like if I know those aren't the people I wanna be. You just gonna... answered that question. So why would you, why would you, how can there be an opportunity with people you don't wanna be with? Right. That, that, that's, that's an oxymoron as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. If those, so I'm, that, that's a general principle you kind of follow. Because oh, I, I won't I, be there. Yeah. I won't be there. Yeah. Because the bottom line of it is, I, I did a video ages ago um, called The Chug Test. Mm -hmm. And I actually identified, after going through this wearing suit stage, mm -hmm. um, I actually thought to myself, if I, if I can't sit down and have a whiskey with someone, I don't want them in my life. Yeah. So it kind of grew. And in the end... My wife and even my team now will talk about a project. We'll talk about a new client and we'll go, we're about the chug test. And you'll get someone go, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to have a drink with them. But hey, they're billionaires. Yeah. Well, let's go with the chug test. They're not in. Yeah. And so it's a very primitive. And the chug test is like this. And this is very deep. <laughs> so you're walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other side of the street is a client, a vendor, someone in your family, uh, an account. All right, guys, I want to take a quick break to talk to you about watches. You guys know that I am a minimalist. I don't spend a lot of money on crap, but I do love having a really nice, stylish watch that you can dress up or dress down, and that's where Movement Watches comes in, MVMT. Uh, this company was started by two broke college kids that wanted to wear stylish watches, but they couldn't afford them, so they started their own watch company. Now, that sounds familiar. I know a lot of us, a lot of guests on, on this podcast have done that. I've done that. A lot of you guys listening have done that. Uh, and they were founded on the belief that you know style shouldn't break the bank. And now they have sold over 1 million watches to customers in 160 countries around the world. MVMT Watches has solidified itself as the world's fastest growing watch company. The, they, the, the watches start at just $95. At a department store, you're looking at 400 to 500 bucks for one of these. But what they figured out is that by selling online, they were able to cut out the middleman and the retail markup, and thus provide you with the best possible price. You get a classic design, quality construction, styled minimalism, by going right now to mvmt.com slash jay, mvmt.com slash jay. This watch has a really clean design that makes a great fashion statement. Now is the time to step up your watch game. Go to mvmt.com slash jay to join the movement. So you talked about community and connection. I would like to hear your take a little bit more on that. How can people foster? Like if someone's listening, like, man, I don't have a great circle around me. I live in the middle of nowhere. Like, and they feel lonely and isolated, which people do now being connected to their devices all day. What would you say to that person? Like, how do you get out and kind of foster that a little bit more? Well, the proactively. Good, yeah, there's a lot of forums and there's a lot of communities on Facebooks and stuff like that. And you can actually find them, but you've got to put the work, you've got to put the energy in. Building up a relationship is literally like growing an oak tree. You get a tiny little seed, you can't throw it in the ground and then go, grow! Yeah. You know, you've got to nurture, prune, water. Right. You've got to care for that thing to grow. Okay. And there's vulnerable stages when it's when it's young, when it's fragile. That's when it's really, really vulnerable. You've got to build that relationship up to the size of a 300-year-old oak tree. Mm. So if you're trying to reach out there, and also this helps you with your own voice, get into communities and start conversing. Start challenging. If someone says something in a community, so let's say for argument's sake, I don't know, you make dolls. Mm -hmm. You know, handmade the most exquisite dolls in the world. There's communities out there and forums that for, for doll lovers and, and those kind of things. Get into those, yeah. okay? And then start asking questions. Hey, what do you think the best paint is? What do you think the best hair substitute is? You know, I'm sounding like I know a lot about dolls here, but um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think something as far away from me as yeah. possible. Um, but then just try and ask questions and start getting... A, Find out who resonates with you because you'll be surprised at the amount of people that are in that formal community that actually are the same as you, 
looking for someone else in that form or, or community that they can resonate mm-hmm. with. And then you go on private and you start chatting with them and you go, hey, let's get off this, this uh, texting platform. And that's the key. Yeah. Let's get Skype in. Yeah. You know, Skype is brilliant. FaceTime is great. If you don't want to give your phone number away, Skype with someone. Okay. Because that's safe. You can disconnect them. You can right. you know, block them. You can do that. You can't do that with your phone number. So get on Skype and just face to face and go, we have chatted for so long. You know, why did you respond to my questions? And start finding out, is there a, a relationship here? Yeah. Is there some growth here? Is there any kind of um, even keel? Yeah. Um, you can also, if you're trying to build up a relationship with someone and there's someone you specifically want to get in front of, give them a reason to be interested in you because you're already interested in them. So you can go through Google and you can uh, look on their Instagram feeds and their Facebook and you can find out that they love cooking. You know, they love traveling to Europe. They uh, (laughs) collect vintage Porsche, you know, whatever. Yeah. Go and get a magazine. Oh, here's a really cool one. Get a magazine subscription, okay? Sign them up for the magazine subscription, Mm. okay? I try to keep my gifts under $30. Okay. There was a story. I was going to an event, and uh, I'd been invited to this event, and the guy was a very prominent um, wine collector. So he he had this event going on. He was someone that I knew through someone, but I wanted to build on my relationship with him. I already had a client that was close to him. So if you're friends with that person, that person's friends with that person, you can kind of guess that they must be similar kind of mindset. Right. So this guy was having an event at his house up in Ohio, and everyone knew that he collected wine. And he'd invite a bunch of people. And like all parties, you've got a ton of salesmen there trying to sell him banking services, jets, and all this kind of stuff. I was with these two guys as we came in, and they got these two boxes, and they had bought him wine. Now I thought to myself, that's a long shot. When someone really knows about wine, you're going to buy wine for them? Yeah. That's ballsy, right? you know? So, okay, fine, let's see how that goes. And I just walked in there, and I never had any baggages or anything like that with me. And the guys were looking at me, and one of the guys knew me from an article. And he's like, oh, you know, you're Steve Simpson. He's like, oh, we should talk. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And uh, we walked in, and I saw him give this, this box to the guy. And the guy was, oh, thank you very much, and puts it down. He doesn't want to unwrap a box with sure. a bunch of people walking through the door. So for straight away... No one knows what's in that box. Right. And more than likely, no one's going to know until he's left. Okay? So the whole kind of, oh, I can't believe he bought me this this Rothschild or this, you know, 199 barefoot or whatever. <laughs> um, but I turned around to him and I had it in clear wrapping. I had a foil remover. You know the top of the wine bottles mm-hmm. has that foil? Yeah. And you either cut your fingers off by doing it with a knife or you get one of those little spinners. Yeah. Okay? So I bought him a little spinner put it in a clear thing and in my pocket and I came and I went, there you go. I know you love wine. Hopefully. They-. And he was like, oh, thank you so much. He went, oh, my fingers on this. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I don't know how much these guys had spent on wine. Mine was 25 bucks out of BevMo. Yeah. Okay. It was the attention to detail right. that took him. But later on that evening, here was the funny thing. He got some wines out for us to try and he was holding court and showing off her. But you know the funny thing? There was about six of these bottles of wine there. Every single one he took off my little wow. my little uh, foil capper. And it was just really cool. And I just thought to myself, that's why. So focus on the really small stuff. If you see someone loves shoes, send them a shoehorn. I sent someone a shoehorn um, and I did it in bone. Um, a little bone shoehorn. Mm. I think off of Amazon, like the two of them were like, you know, 80 bucks or something like that. They're not expensive. But here's the thing. You can't take a metal shoehorn on carry-on anymore uh, because it's a lump of metal, mm. okay? Bone uh, yeah. doesn't set it off. So I went to him, I know you travel. I know you like good shoes. Travel well. Yeah. And send him a bone shoehorn. Yeah. Okay. The attention to detail. I love it. Tiny, tiny little thing. Yeah. Travel plugs. That's another great one. Travel plugs. You know, when you know people are traveling, I, and you say to them, and you and resonate, get on the same level and go, yeah. Jason, I travel a ton. I see you're traveling a ton. Don't you hate you when you get there and you try to find a bloody adapter? And worse still, you're trying to find an adapter for your plugs in a foreign country yeah. when you shouldn't be worried about it. So I threw one in the post for you. That's great. So it's those kind of things that, and then you can say to them, 
I'd really like to follow up with you on something. Mm. You've already shown that you pay attention to them and that you know, you're on that same level. That's how you build it up. And if you haven't spoken to someone for a while, that magazine subscription's brilliant mm -hmm. because it means every two months they're getting a magazine and they're reading that magazine going, oh, Sim sent me this. Yeah. And every now and then, what will happen? And it's usually on the quarterlies. I'll get some of them reach out to me saying things like, oh, Steve, we haven't spoke. And I will not think to myself, your magazine's just yeah. like You know, wow. that's why. So there's nothing better than people contacting you. Yeah. So you mentioned follow up there. And I think that's where a lot of people drop the ball in establishing personal relationships in business. Expand on the importance of the follow up and why you take the ball in your court there. Well, that's uh, that's where you do the pruning, the nurturing, you protect the fragile growth. That's how you grow a relationship. That's that's the strength. The other bits we've talking about are just sparkly little seeds to get their attention. If there's no follow up, there's no relationship. Yeah. Uh, and you want to get it up to that point where it is the 300 year old oak tree, where if you do something wrong if you slip up if you don't talk to them the tree the relationship is strong enough that can sustain you not being in contact with them for six years so in the early stage there is a lot of follow-up required i find it funny that people will actually put a doctor's meeting in a calendar but they won't put follow-up with jimmy mm. in a calendar mm -hmm. um and so i will speak with you today and then i will put put in there like in six weeks time Follow up with Jason, and then and you can do this on your phone. And in the notes section of that e uh, of that uh, um, reminder, you put in there. I did a podcast with him. He had a great place overlooking the ocean. We spoke about this. We spoke about. And you make these little notes. Yeah. Okay. And then what you do is you go back, and then like six weeks later, you can say, "Oh, I was thinking of you. I saw a fellow, and he had a G Shock on. I remember yours. It was cool. In fact, I was telling my boy, it can be the most offbeat thing that you're now discussing. Yeah. But it now lets them know that A, you paid attention and B, you found being in communication was valuable enough, valuable enough for you to take time out of your day to reach out to that person. Right. And you can follow, if you're in an event and the person says something, use that, you know, follow up with them six weeks later and say, oh, I know you said you were off to the Algarve. Oh, I know you said you were running over to the Maldives. How did that go? I've not been. I just wanted to hear what you thought of it. So you've got to, you've got to nurture it. And talk about your, 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 your touch on it a little bit, but your three favorite ways of communicating. Because I know when we first got connected, you immediately got on the phone. So you do things to stand out and be different. Um, I try to do things where there's less noise. Yeah. You know, I'm really stunned how people use email. And, and, and for argument's sake, you pick up your phone in the morning, you pour in your coffee, you got three phone calls, mm -hmm. you got three texts, you got 400 emails. Which do you answer first? Well, I don't have email on my phone, so you're asking the wrong person. There you go. <laughs> but everyone's always going to answer, and I'm calling it out here. Text, phone call, email in that order. Yeah, Okay. I, I would agree. Right. So I always try to text someone, okay? If I've got that phone number, I want to get on the phone with them. And it's for two reasons. Like when we got on the phone, I wanted to find out if you were a flake. Yeah. You know, it interested me because we came from a mutual friend. Yep. But I wanted to make sure that it was okay. So straight away, had we not come from that mutual friend, maybe I would have communicated with you through text or through video text. Mm. I love doing a little video on a phone and texting to someone going, hey, this is Steve. I don't want to go backwards and forwards. And plus the fact when we speak, we can do that faster than type. Yeah. Okay. And you could do it anywhere as well. So those want, video texts are great. They really stand, make you stand out, and like it gives oh, a person a special yeah. feeling. I, and and that's that's the thing. There's a there's a I can't remember his name. God, I should. There's this German professor that actually went through how many people read your email, and it was a really good survey. But the ending was that always imagine that your email will be read in the worst possible way that it can mm. so you may send someone an email saying you know beer tonight seven o'clock question mark and in your head you're going jason beer tonight seven o'clock let's do it boy yeah the other person looks at it and goes well this is very demanding <laughs> yeah right you know is that my only bloody option beer mm -hmm. you know I, I don't drink beer you know so it could be all but if you video and go hey we haven't had the chance to get together beer tonight seven o'clock They've got your energy. They've got your personality. You're doing it on the beach. You're doing it at a bus stop, wherever. Yeah. You've got all of this, um, all of this scenery going on, which is appealing to their vision. 
the sound, mm. you're engaging with the people with the people on so many different levels rather than text. Yeah. So we've got all these. It's so funny because what you said is so obvious, but people don't think of it. Like when you pointed out the different senses and the sound, amazing. Yeah. Oh, I love sending people stuff. Yeah. Post. It, how many how many fingers did it take to delete an email? How many fingers? Yeah. One. Okay. How many fingers did it take to open up a letter? All of them. Bingo! Yeah, yeah. You can't be checking your emails when you're opening up a letter right, they've sent you. Right. So what I will do, and I'm going to do it today, is um, I will go. I'll probably go down to um, shutters. Okay. okay. And I'm going to go down shutters as I walk in. I'm going to go to the reception desk and I'm going to go. Hey, I'd like 20 envelopes. I've got some letters to send out. They will give you stationery and envelopes. Mm. Okay. And then you scribble something on there, send it to your clients. Okay. And you can even go to the desk and go, Hey, have you got any stamps? And you can do it there and then. You yeah. know, and I'll probably do it while I'm having lunch. All of a sudden, a client, a vendor, a partner, someone like that will get a letter. Now, here's the beautiful thing. If it's a brown envelope or if it's a letter that's got um, a typed address on it, the secretary, the personal assistant, the wife, whatever, will open it because they will think it's a bill. Mm. It's a demand. Mm -hmm. If it comes from a hotel and it's got a handwritten uh, address on the front of it, they actually put that through because that's personal and private. Right. Okay. Now all of a sudden it's got straight through to who you want it. Yeah. And they're opening it up. And there's the, again, there's the rustle, there's the feel. So mm. you're getting the sound and the texture. Yeah. And now you've got in there, and I usually, um, I usually write things in a small Sharpie. So it's bigger than a ballpoint pen, but you know, and brevity. Mm hmm. Dean Jackson said the nine word email. I will put in this, Jason has been too long. Do you mind if I reach out to you next Tuesday? Sims. And I will just send that. Yeah. You know, and you'll get it and you'll get it and you'll go and you'll text me and you'll say, yeah, Tuesday's great or something like that. I've got you contacting me again, but you haven't been checking your emails because you had to use both hands to open up this letter. Yeah. And it's only cost you a stamp. And I've had people say to me before, postage is expensive. What is really expensive are the people that subscribe to you that don't get your message. Mm. Now, I'm a great believer in phallic symbols, okay? And now the modern day phallic symbol is the size of your email list. How big is yours? My email list is fucking huge, yeah. okay? And I don't use it all the time. Because whenever you send out an email to your email list, your open rate, if you're really good, is around 20%. It revolves around 10 to 20% for an open rate. Then there's the click-through rate. That is your message in there that they like, that they send off through. That can again be, if you're really good, 10 to 20%. Usually it's like 5 to 15%. Yep. Okay? So I'm, I'm here saying that you send out 10,000 emails and it gets read by 30 people. You know? That means all of those other people, it didn't hit. You send out 10 envelopes. How many people open them? 10. How many people will respond if they've just got an envelope from the shutters in Santa Monica? 10. Isn't that a damn good ROI? Yeah. Right. So I would rather have people look at the fact that people aren't hearing your message, aren't communicating with you as the real cost here. Mm. So I'd rather have 10 people speaking to me than 150,000 people on email ignoring me. It's it's amazing. Like you're so insightful, but it's it's common sense when you break it down. It's pretty. I did not tell you anything other than I was a East London bricklayer. Yeah. And there's no intelligence. And I got I got people that I hang around with, like you know Peter Diamandis and Elon Musk and Richard Branson. When I say these guys are rocket scientists, they are. Yeah. But I'll send them a magazine, or I'll send them a, a, a box of chocolates because they like British chocolates. I sent one of them, and I won't name which one. British biscuits. Yeah, because he he said to me that he loved it when he was over there in England. He had these British biscuits, digestives. Fan of oh, he still, I, I used to love those. Bingo. Yeah. So guess what? He's sitting in his office. He gets this package. He opens it up, enjoying with your coffee, pack of digestive biscuits. Yeah. Does he reach out and say thank you to me? Bingo. That's all. Awesome. So you know, none of this stuff is intelligent. None of this stuff is insightful, hard, scientific. You know, impossible to do. This is all primitive stuff. And while everyone out there is thinking, hey, I'm going to do Snapchat videos for my advertising, or I'm going to do email campaigns or Facebook adverts, I urge you, please keep doing that. I, I really want everyone to keep doing that because all the time you're doing it makes my job so much easier.
Unbelievable. I love it. Give me some other primitive kind of basic tips for entrepreneurs that, that people do wrong or, you know, or someone's getting started. Maybe someone, let's say someone works at, at Verizon now. They're like, oh, I want to start something on my own. What would be some, some tips, tips that they should follow, general principles, maybe mistakes they should avoid? Try to fail. Try to uh, fail. Try to fail. I ride motorcycles and I remember going down to um, listen to Wave One. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of my key things. I listen to everyone's opinion. And if it resonates with me, I keep it. If it doesn't, I dump it. And I remember being at a MotoGP race and uh, I'm all over these MotoGP bikes. And I was very fortunate to be in the pits and I'm, you know, all over this machine. I'm looking at it and there's an engineer there doing some work on the, the machinery. And I said to him, what are you looking for? And he said, well, we're looking for it to break. And I went, oh yeah. He went, no, no, no. We, we want to know how far we can push it before it breaks. Because when we can find out where it breaks, we can make that bit stronger, which makes the bike go faster. So we're looking for its point of failure. I was mm. like, oh, that's great. Yeah. That was the perception that told me that failure doesn't define us, it encourages us. It gives us the education on what not to do, or it gives us the education on what to strengthen. So I'm a great believer, believer in failure is feedback. And I constantly fail, constantly screw up. Trouble is at school, we're taught that that's not good. Right. We're taught that if you don't understand what the teacher's saying, ask once, maybe ask twice, but if you ask a third time, you're a spastic and you are going to be humiliated. <laughs> so I'm a great believer that just ask as many times as you need to. Fall over. My, my dad, you know, big, thick Irish lad, turned around to me and said, no one ever drowned by falling in water. They drowned by staying there. Mm. And I remember the age of 16 thinking, bloody hell does that mean, you know? Years later, I'm quoting it as many times as I can because I tell my kids, fall over. Then you'll learn how to get back up. So the boy's sitting in Verizon at the moment going, I want to start my own job. Good for you. What do you want to do and why are you so good at it? Be prepared to be screwed, broke, bent over, ripped off, and for all of it, the fail. Because that will be the stuff that makes you strong. How do you personally bounce back from a failure? Because a lot of people will let it cripple them and then they don't try again. Oh, is it important to maybe just start trying the next day, like not, not wallow in it too much? Or It's that perception where I won't allow the failure to define me. I'll allow it to educate me. And we're all scared of things. We're all frightened. We're animals. Sure. Okay. And we've all got that fight or flight instinct in us. Um, and as soon as something goes wrong, we're faced with that fight or flight decision to yeah. make. I educated myself years ago by habit. And do you remember we spoke about earlier about defining habits? Mm -hmm. um, I educated myself a, uh, earlier that I know as an animal, I'm gonna be scared of things. So I'm gonna educate myself as to what to be scared of. And one of the biggest things that frightens me is being in exactly the same position I am today than I will be next week. Mm -hmm. And what's going to be the only differentiator is going to be failing. Because if I know, oh, I can't jump that on a skateboard at the age of 51, I shouldn't be doing that. You know, these are all things that are going to define and educate me. I will go to a restaurant and I will try and order something off the menu, which I have no idea what it is. And you can do that in like tapas, sushi, Indian restaurant. You go, well, that one sounds weird. I want that. <laughs> and then it'll come and it'll make your, your butt rot for a month. But you <laughs> yeah. now know. You yeah. now educate. Well, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. It can be the smallest of things. Um, if there's the Verizon person out there trying to start his own company, if you know what the company is, get onto GoDaddy within the next hour and spend $9.99 on a domain. Yeah. Okay? You are now further ahead in your goal than you were yesterday. Okay, the following day, okay, you know what you want to do? Who's already doing it? Let me learn from their mistakes. You know, where do they sell it? Where do they supply? Will I, A, follow them and just get in the draft? Or will I, well, okay, that's working, but they're not trying this over here. Mm. Let's step outside the box. And guess what? You get out there, you get your, fa your face smacked, and you can go back again. I remember when I used to do kickboxing. And I was a big lad when I was when I was a kid. And I always got beaten to shit. Okay. I was the big lad at school. Therefore, anyone trying to get their stripes would pick on me. I wasn't a very aggressive fellow. I'm still not aggressive. I would always be the guy that would get my head kicked in because I didn't want to fight. I went to kickboxing to learn how to fight. Mm. Something funny happened. The more I knew how to fight, the more people sensed it and stayed away from me. Uh. 
And it was funny. The more I learned how to fight, the less I fought. Right. It was a real funny little thing. But I remember when I would get into a fight and I got a smack in the head. It didn't kill me. You know, I got up in the following morning and my jaw hurt a little bit, but I went about my day. You know, it wasn't those kind of things that you go, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, because this and this. And again, it's that fear that gets in the way. So I want people, I urge people, and I urge my kids to do the same. Grasp failure, because that's the education. And I know a lot of big players, because I've been doing this for 20 plus years now, there is no one that's not at the top of the game. And I'm looking around at these pictures here. You're looking, you're looking on this wall here, and I don't know how much they can see of this video, but there's some brilliant pictures on here. Bob Marley, Muhammad Ali, Bruce Lee. What you got Public here? enemy. Public enemy. This is a wall full of failures. Yeah. Every single one of these people have fallen over, got hurt, got smacked, got ripped off, um, got downtrodden and stamped on and spat on. It didn't define them. Right. It refined them. And they grew back from it. And every single one of these people are winners because they were failures first. You talked about the guy at Verizon. Uh, what if he doesn't know? A lot of people don't know what they want to do. They listen to you like, man, it's clear. Like, you do what you do and you're excellent at it. Some people are kind of just lost and like, I don't, I don't know what the fuck I want to do with my life. What do you say to those people? Like, how do you Try find everything. it? Yeah, yeah I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you and I don't want to be a complacent prick and I apologize if I come across that way. No, no. But I've made so many different mistakes. Shit, I could have been a stockbroker. Yeah. How bad would that have been? <laughs> you know? I could have, you know, I could have been really good at selling those cakes to the supermarkets yeah. and I could have gone, well, that's it. I think the first thing is to get back to being a four-year-old and question everything. Mm. You know, you, you, a four-year-old comes up to you two minutes before dinner and goes, I want a lollipop. You can't have a lollipop. Why? Because it's your dinner. Why? <laughs> because you'll be full up. Why? They just do, they don't care. They just keep going. In the end, you should give them a lollipop. Right. I want people to be that four-year-old and try something and then go, I don't really like that. You've just learned what you're not good at. Yeah. So go and try something else. You know, find out something else. Join classes, join communities. Just don't accept where you are as where you will be. And it's the old elastic band thing. You stretch and you get into different arenas, you try different things, that elastic band will never go back to its original position. You may not like where it's taking you. Great, I just invested in doing a cooking course. Bloody hate cooking. You now know you're not born to be a chef. You know, just be... Just have that refusal to accept the way you are is where you're going to be. Steve, the new book is out now, Blue Fishing. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. And, and before we get into that, tell me off the top of your head, like two or three of the coolest experiences that you've set up for people. I had a client want me to get them married in the Vatican by the Pope. I sent, uh, we've sent about 18 people down in a submarine to see the wreck of the Titanic. Um, I, I've got to admit, I think taking over that academia for a dinner party yeah. and having Andrea Bocelli come in was brilliant. Um, every year I've partnered with Sir Elton John for his Oscar party. So I get to hang out with, you know, Stephen Tyler and Charlie Sheen and Elton John and Dave Furnish and Scott Campbell and all those boys. Um, so my life is blessed. Uh, that's more than three, wasn't it? Yeah. I, no, think, I think you asked for two, didn't you? Yeah. So, okay, well, there's a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I know we covered this a little bit, but, but tell me about your first big, I just want to backtrack for one sec because I, I glossed over this, your first big celebrity or powerful person that you connected with and how that happened. Oh, okay. Well, I can tell you I didn't. And that may, I know you just, went, uh, you know, <laughs> I never, even now, now I didn't have the ability back in the 80s and 90s, but even now I never Google any applicant. Okay. So to get into my company and to get into my circle, you need to apply. Okay, I make everybody apply. Even if a friend goes, Steve, you got to speak to Jason. That's great. Jason, here's a link. Complete the application and let's chat. Yeah. Never, ever, ever do I Google them. The application comes through, then we arrange a Skype call if possible, if not a phone call. Okay. And we talk to each other. I want to find out if there's a fit. Then I may go and Google. And I remember that I was actually, um, do you know who Teddy Forsman is? Mm -mm. Okay, so Teddy Forsman, I remember working down in Monaco and meeting Teddy and Brian Moss. Um, Teddy, unfortunately, is dead now. Um, and I was meeting Teddy and Brian, and these guys were just brilliant. And I was knocking around at the time with a guy called Edward Asprey. And we'd been invited down to Monaco Grand Prix, and we had some clients down there. 
These were just three rock solid, confident, cool people. And I remember Edward Asprey once, uh, we went into a, a bar, uh, went into a, a party, and he walked behind the uh, bar and got himself a drink. And then while behind the bar, Served a few other people. <laughs> I just thought, that's really cool. Yeah. Never really thought about it. Found out later on that it was his party. Found out further on that they were the jewelers to the Queen of England. And this was one of the owners of the company that spends all of his days chatting with royalty, yet was so humble and secure that would be happy enough and comfortable enough to stand behind a bar and just serve some people drinks wow. because he was there. Yeah. And then I found out Brian actually owned Gulfstream Aircraft, the wealthiest, most expensive jets in the world. Yeah. You know, these people were just so comfortable in themselves that I liked them before I found out who they were. And there's been a number of people that I've, I've then found out afterwards that are intimidating. And I've gone, bloody hell. And I've said to them, I am really proud I never read that article before I got to know you because now I know you and not what your Wikipedia page says. Right. So I'm a great believer. Don't Google anyone. Yeah. Get to like them first and then work out afterwards. Maybe you're bored and you want to drink a coffee and go, who is this I'm dealing with? Oh my God, he owns England. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So tell us a little bit more about the new book. Um, it was, whew, so 20 odd years later, loads of TV, media, podcasts, radio, all that kind of stuff, always on the luxury industry or giving you an insider scoop on, you know, the Grammys or something like that. I had often been asked to write a book and do an expose on all these clients and what they got up to. And I said, quite simply, I will never mention a client's name. And so, you know, the book deal, you know, I kept on getting them, but they never went anywhere. Yeah. Jason Gaynard. A few years ago, Mastermind Talks um, asked me to get up on stage. And he said, I don't want you talking about the world of luxury. I want you to talk about how you do it. How do you get in touch with the Vatican? How do you get in touch with, you know, these people that you do? Yeah. We want to know the, the, you know, the guide for dummies on how you, a thick-headed bricklayer, does this stuff. Um, so I started doing some talks and EO groups and entrepreneurs and schools and stuff, just going, Let, you know, get out of the way of yourself. You know, the paralysis by analysis thing. And um, then uh, Tucker Max helped me and said, you know, we should introduce you to an agent, see if there's a book here with this, th this theme. You're know, helping entrepreneurs, people finding how to build a relationship, finding their passion, how to identify a relationship, yeah. you know, those kind of things. So we started spitballing it around. And then this is another one of those examples. I met up with someone in New York who introduced me to a girl. And then the following week, they said, we'd like to do a book. And I went, that's great. You know, who are you? They went, Simon Schuster. And I went, oh, that's nice. Never had any idea who Simon Schuster was. The largest <laughs> publishing house in, in America and the world. And um, then uh, luckily, I, I started chatting with some good friends of mine. And a uh, good one that kind of jumped to my aid was Jay Abraham. So, you know, luckily, I have a good circle. Yeah. He literally said, get down my house on Friday, bring one of your bottles of whiskey, and let's work out what the book's going to be about. And that's what we did. Um, just hung out with him, drinking good whiskey, wow. and shooting the shit, and then uh, came up with the concept that this book needs to be an uneducated, primitive, impossible to misunderstand guidebook on what you need to do. Mm. And after we wrote the book, um, Michelle Martin up at Simon Schuster came up with um, calling it The Art of Making Things Happen. And we like that because there is an art, I tell you about it in the book, but you're the one that's got to make it happen. So after every chapter on, hey, I did this with X or I made this happen with you know this rock band, these are the 12 steps that I used to make it happen. You can use those 12 steps yeah. in doing your next bar mitzvah or you know, doing a, a, a proposal with your girlfriend or trying to get a relationship or trying to how to uh, look at your circle and get rid of the vampires in it or build up the ROI on your relationships or your marketing. Every chapter has a playlist on what you need to do to improve where you are. I love it. And where can people find the book and find out more about your stuff? Well, I've got a website, stevedsims.com. Um, uh, Bluefish, thebluefish.com is the, the concierge. And tasteofblue.com is the other uh, membership platform we have. But you can go on Amazon, Bluefishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Uh, I urge a lot of people not to buy the book if they think it's going to make them wealthy. They need to buy the book and then do something about it. I don't want these people that buy diet books and then wonder why they're not slim. <laughs> you know, it's the action that makes it happen. Right. Well, Steve, this was great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. 
Guys, as always, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next time.